I'm Dennis Anderson along with Pamela Fish and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Duluth's Glen Sheen Mansion now has an official guidebook for the first time. We'll talk with the book's author and Glen Sheen's director. A Duluth marketing agency is opening its office for creative workshops with kids on the autism spectrum. More on the Islands of Brilliance experience tonight. And we'll have an update on efforts to clean up the St. Louis River from pollution deposited there decades ago. We have these stories and more coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. Pamela Fish is here tonight, filling in for Julie. Pam, welcome back. Thanks, Denny. Glad to be here. We've got some great topics tonight, so you're up first. I'm up first. Let's mm -hmm. get started. All right. Well, Duluth Glen Sheen Mansion has been a favorite destination for visitors and locals for decades. Last season, the historic estate topped 100,000 visitors, making it the most visited house museum in Minnesota. Yet one thing has been missing from the Glen Sheen experience, an official guidebook worthy of the mansion. That changes beginning this weekend with the release of Glen Sheen, a new book from Xena City Press. Joining us now is the book's author, Tony Dierkins, publisher at Xena City Press, and Dan Hartman is the director of the Glen Sheen Mansion. Thanks to both of you for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, Tony, of course, you've done a number of, of books about the area and the history, but this one is different in that it's an official book. Dan, tell us how that came to be. Well, to be honest, it's been in the works for probably 35 years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or should have been. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> And so this is something that when I first came on board, it was kind of astonishing that we really didn't have one of these yet. And honestly, the best local publisher we have for history in Duluth was Tony. So as soon as we could, we kind of came together. It was nice. And I've been <coughs> trying to get this done since 2003. Yeah. I first mm -hmm. had a, a conversation uh, with uh, Jack Bor Bowman, the former dean of the School of Fine Arts at UMD. And uh, we were enthusiastic about it, but it never got yeah. around to getting done. And so uh, now here we are. Tony, what will this book show that perhaps other books on Glen Sheen haven't? Well, there have been some nice other books, little uh, on the, the construction and some of these other things, but there's never been a really complete tour. And I, I have to point out that this book is mostly Dennis O'Hara photographs. Mm -hmm. They're really gorgeous. It starts with a history of the family and uh, through 1977 and then goes into a tour room by room, floor by floor, the grounds. You get the, the whole Glen Sheen experience. Dennis O'Hara is a fabulous yeah. local photographer. Did, maybe you can both talk a little bit about the photos in the book. Did he capture the essence of what Glenn Sheen truly is? He's definitely the closest that anyone ever has in the past. Yeah. And I think when we were selecting photographers, we didn't really take a lot of time because Dennis had taken some photos on the side before the year, and I was like, Ooh, this is amazing. And he had a blast, frankly, taking these photographs too. So. Yeah, he enjoyed it. Dennis and I did two previous books, including Picture Duluth. Uh, and some other things. And we needed a, another one, the new creative director, Scotty Gardonio, and I both practically said his name at the same time. So yeah. it, was, it was a slam dunk. Yeah. yeah, as we're seeing those pictures, uh, it's a great example of really the beauty of his work. But mm -hmm. um, as you <coughs> said, you, uh, you tell the story in the beginning about the history of the family. And one of the things I found interesting in the research on this book is that you Dan, you found some new things, I guess, yeah, that yeah. people didn't know before. Well, I mean, sadly, a lot of Chester's involvement in our region was kind of forgotten before. And in the process of getting ready for this book, you know, me and Tony actually put together a small paper that really went on his website and got a lot of traffic. But it's really this grand story of how Chester was involved in developing the Misabi Iron Range, but also how he used his wealth to help start the North Shore Drive. I mean, both those stories really haven't gone very public before, and this book really kind of highlights those mm -hmm. stories. And we also introduce you to the family members. As you're touring through the book, you stop at someone's bedroom. There's a photo of the person that room was designed for and a biography 
a uh, brief biography of their life too. So we want you to introduce you to yeah. not just the house, but the family that lived there. Which begs the question, if Clara and Chester Congdon could watch into the, walk into that house today, would they recognize their home? I think so. I'm going to let Dan speak to that. That's <laughs> it's, it's an amazing part of the story, really. Yeah, I think they absolutely would. Um, we've done a lot to renovate it to make sure it looks more like 1910 than it did in 1977, frankly. And, and that's only getting better with time. I think there'll, there'll still be astonished to see some changes yeah. that were made, but, but overall. But still, most of their custom-made furniture, almost all of it, still there. Yeah. Their, their carpets, their wall coverings, still there. Some of them in the very place they put yeah. them in. So, it, nice yeah, 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 it's amazing. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's significant about Glen Sheen, yeah. as opposed to some of the other historic homes. Just to elaborate on that a little bit. So over 95% of our collection is actually the family still. Um, but what's really interesting inside of that is there's a lot of homes that have the original family material, but not many that actually date back from the construction of the home. And so as you tour Glenching, all the rooms really do look very similar to 1910 because it's the same pieces that were there. Um, and just to highlight this, um, last year we spent some money and we took off some latex paint off a wall and behind that was the original hand-drawn stencil of these birds in Robert's room. Yeah. And so even if, it, if we don't have the original, it's usually behind something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's there and what's yeah. astonishing is we, we found you know, last year we did the historic lynching book, mm -hmm. and you can practically line up those photos, you know, in yeah. front of a yeah. uh, walk through the house and see the same scene. How much of the house is actually depicted in this book? Uh, just to, like I said before, we, we go, we start with the exterior, then we go room by room, floor by floor, uh, throughout the whole house, then out to the grounds and the carriage house yeah. and the rustic trail system and the formal garden and the. So it's almost like walking in the front door, going through the house and out the back door. And exactly. You see the in fact, okay. if you've been on the tour before, a good part of the book is patterned after the very way you walk through the house on the tour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, and I will add too. I think what I love about this book is if you just took the tour, you'll find things in this book that you missed on the tour. And it really makes you want to kind of go back because there's so much more in this book than you typically will actually get on a tour. And at the same time, there's so much more to the house that's in the book <laughs> that you have to take a tour to fully appreciate what you're seeing in the book. Yeah. So they, they feed on each other because it's, uh, the, you can't replicate the house in, in the two-dimensional page. Dan, what do you attribute to the, uh, the great um, interest in visitors? You, you know, you, through your record attendance last year. If you've ever been to Glenshine, it's a beautiful place. And I think one of the things that we've done well in the last couple of years is really kind of get people what I call beyond the murder. And to really focus yeah. on the legacy mm -hmm. of the Glenshine estate, but also just the general beauty of it. It's hard to drive up the North Shore and not see Glenshine and then kind of be curious of what it is. And as we bring this awareness up, people are, are taking that turn in and they're just amazed by what they see. And in the last year, we're getting a lot more repeat customers than we've had in the past, and that's helped a lot as yeah. well. Dan, when you look at demographics, is there one age group over another that perhaps is showing most interest in that house? Yeah, absolutely. Um, believe it or not, it's actually a very young audience. Mm. Really? Uh, we have more 18 to 25 year olds than I have 65 plus. Mm. Um, and so that's really changed our entire market. To marketing. what do you attribute that? Um, I'll say it again, it's beyond the murder. And so for a lot of people who lived during the saga of the murder, that was the thing that brought them in. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, for the younger demographic, they never lived through that. Right. And so for them, it's more of the beauty of the mansion and Lake Superior and all, all the elements you see in this book. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big shift. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we want to talk a little bit about what needs to be done at Glen Sheen. This depicts it as, very, as gorgeous, but yeah. we know uh, it needs some work. So tell us a little bit about what's going on with a request to the legislature and money needed for... Capital improvements. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. um, as you can probably see on my button, we're part of the Save Glen Sheen campaign for bonding this year. And, you know, a lot of things are in great shape. We've actually spent $12 million to make a lot of changes to Glen Sheen over the last 30 years. Um, but our formal garden, our boathouse, and our servant's porch are all actually in pretty terrible shape. Um, our formal garden, for example, if you've been there recently, you can see you can just pull a brick right off of the wall. Mm -hmm. um, one section, if, it, if we have a snowfall like two years ago, that'll probably fall down. Um, but also our boathouse. I think the boathouse is one of these great forgotten spaces at Glenshain, mm -hmm. partly because it's been falling down. But if we restore that, that's one of the last structural boathouses on the entire Lake Superior. You know, in Minnesota, we brag about how we're a lake state, and in Duluth, we love our Lake Superior, right. yet here's one of the very last structural boathouses, and if we don't do something soon, it's going to go into the lake. Now, on the other hand, if we save it, we'll have the last structural boathouse available for our public to come yeah. and enjoy, and there's very few better views than that in Duluth. 
So you're seeking what kind of dollars then from the state? So these are legislative bonding dollars. Mm, like how many millions? So our total bill is 26, but honestly, I'm really hoping to come away with eight for these three critical repairs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when will you know more as to whether or not that's a going to yeah, happen. I, I mean, this is politics, so I, I keep telling people <laughs> June, and let's, let's hope we know by June. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Tony, t just tell us in the, in the brief time we have left how this compares to some of the other books you've done. I've done a lot of other books, and I'm really proud of them. I've, in fact, one of them is Will to Murder, about the, the crime. For me, this is an opportunity uh, to, to, like Dan said, I, I, although I published that book, I feel it's a shame that the, the greatest fame this house has is that one night, yeah. that yeah. one incident. There's so much more to the story. There's so much more about it. So I'm, I'm extremely proud and pleased uh, to be part of this, too. And uh, I'm hoping people will come out Wednesday night mm -hmm. to Glen Sheen, uh, 7 p.m. It opens at 6.30. We're going to have a signing. Dennis O'Hare is going to be there. Dan's going to be there. Uh, we give you a little show, some refreshments, and then we're going to sign books. And, and you get to stroll Glen Sheen for free. It's beautiful. Ooh. Dennis outdid himself on the photography. Yeah. It is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. is. Well, it and really that sounds is. like a great event. So good luck with that on Wednesday. And thank you both for coming in to talk thank more you. about it and, and the official guidebook. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. Transportation officials call it freight hauling of the future. These special piggyback cars are designed to link rail lines and truckers together so cargo can reach its destination. And now intermodal transportation is coming to either Duluth or Superior. Uh, we have planned a hub for uh, for the uh, uh, Twin Ports area. And the question right now is exactly where to locate it. We don't know. Uh, we want to quickly get on with it and, uh, and connect uh, Duluth Superior with the rest of our network. Burlington Northern is no stranger to intermodal shipping. Last year, the rail line handled more than a million loads across the country. Local shipping experts say the prospects of a BN hub in the Twin Ports are encouraging. This should help uh, reduce costs uh, for our regional shippers who always are faced with distance questions. And if it works the way we would all like to see it work, well, it'll also enhance our abilities to handle waterborne transportation. Burlington Northern says intermodal hauling not only makes economic sense, but environmental sense as well, by relieving some of the trucking pressure on our local highways. At $10,000 apiece, these containers represent what BN officials say is a serious investment in Northland rail shipping. Best case scenario, an intermodal hub right here in the Twin Ports by late summer or early fall. Ryan Davenport, KDLH News. Children on the autism spectrum often have lots of untapped potential. The question is, how do you tap that potential and bring it to the surface? HTK Marketing of Duluth is teaming up with a nonprofit learning group to pair autistic kids with creative mentors in a week-long workshop this summer. Now, this is the first time the Islands of Brilliance learning experience has been offered here in Duluth. And here to tell us more is Mark Fairbanks, co-founder of Islands of Brilliance, Margaret Fairbanks is co-founder and director of education for Islands of Brilliance. And Marcia Heisted is a partner and chief creative officer at HTK Marketing. Thank you all for being here. Yeah. Marcia, how did and why did HTK decide to become involved in this project? Well, we, um, <clears throat> we have a, a mission statement at HTK that, is to, that we exist to create a healthy world. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of marketing that we do. And so we do a lot of healthcare marketing, a lot of nonprofit work public awareness campaigns. I hired a new designer a couple of months ago, and Annie volunteered at, to do a workshop in Minneapolis last summer. And she came to me one day and she said, what do you think about bringing this to Duluth? And when she told me about it, I thought it's a natural to, to, to team up our designers. It's a good fit. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a, such a good fit. So yeah, so we're really, really excited to bring it. So are we. Yeah. <laughs> so Mark, tell us about Islands of Brilliance. And in, in a nutshell, what is it? 
Uh, it's a creative workshop, so we match children and young adults on the autism spectrum, ages 10 to 18, one-on-one -on -one with a creative design mentor. And they work on Mac computers. They use Adobe Creative Cloud software, which is the professional software that we use in the business. And then together, they will work on a project. And most often, it's an 18 by 24 inch poster. And it's centered on the student's area of affinity. So children on the spectrum usually gravitate towards a certain subject matter. So we'll see uh, projects about the latest Pixar film. We see a lot of Minecraft posters. Uh, we see Super Mario things. So this combination of the subject matter expertise, uh, the technology, the kids are very proficient at that, and then kind of the one-on-one -on -one best buddy, if you are the creative best buddy, mm -hmm. makes for an experience where uh, the children uh, are very focused yeah. and, and learn at yeah. it. Now, Marsha, mm -hmm. you, you have a son with autism. Yes. Th that's how you got involved in this project then? He was sort of the inspiration. We saw what he was capable of doing. Uh, there are so many people who say, oh, you know, we were told early on, oh, he's not creative. He's just, you know, imitating what he sees. Well, isn't that art? I mean, art <laughs> is, you know, an imitation yeah. of our, our life. So uh, Mark has a great story about when he was working on a laptop, Harry's like, Dad, can I try that? And he showed him a couple things, and half an hour later, Harry's yeah. doing things that he hadn't taught him how to do. What is it's, autism? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it is a neurological disorder, so it, it, the, the brain is different mm -hmm. on, in kids with autism and adults with autism. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of issues with communication, uh, sensory processing. Um, it, it, that's a big question. That's a yeah. hard to answer. With a lot of answers rather right. than one and or two. Yeah. The challenge is there's a lot of, if you meet one kid with autism, you met one kid with autism. So what is similar about them is what is similar about all of us. Yeah. And what is unique about them is what, again, so yeah. it's what we try to do is build on strengths. Yeah. And what are what are they capable of doing instead of what are they what is that disability? So we try to flip the lens a little bit. Mm -hmm. I just want to uh, bring Marsh into the conversation. Do you have background with autism kids in the autism spectrum, or is it just your um, company that um, can contribute something here? I don't personally have it, mm -hmm. um, but I was telling a story today that I coached Destination Imagination for about twelve years and. A lot of times the kids that gravitate toward that, the kids who are creative tend to be, sometimes be called misfits or they're, you know, they're not the smartest kid in the class and I, I'm a designer by trade and I just think that there's opportunity in my profession for all sorts of yeah. people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I said to someone today, I've never ever seen a college transcript of anybody I've ever hired. <laughs> in 30 years. I want to see their creativity in their book. Mm -hmm. I want to see their portfolio. Sure. And we saw some work today from past workshops. We had a, uh, an info session and I, I oh, well, I'd hire dating. your son tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he would love so to is, the, is that yeah. part of what this is about to make these kids more employable? I would say a uh, short term, I'd say the program wants to provide a positive learning environment. Mm -hmm. um, often these kids, you know, that's one thing we talked about <laughs> today is School is often not a positive experience for the kids, and mm -hmm. so they're not successful, so they don't want to go to school, and that kind of mushrooms. You create an environment that's designed for kids on the spectrum and allows them, like Mark said, with the areas of affinity. When you can drive a project and you're given one-on-one -on -one and technology mm -hmm. and you're in this phenomenal facility <laughs> that we're going to be able to be in this summer, it just builds on confidence yeah. and social. I mean, the kids just do amazing things, and even the parents are surprised. I didn't know my son or daughter was capable of this. I saw a new so, side of them. But part of it is that we are surfacing kids with talent where they can pursue this mm -hmm. as a career path. So giving them avenues to go uh, to school for this as well as pursue it as yeah. a career. I, I think the percentage of kids we see who are able to do this is much higher than we thought yeah. when we first started out. So there is a creative side mm -hmm. of people with autism. Is that what you're trying to bring out then, their creativity in what will take place here this summer? I think that's a combination mm -hmm. of that and just an opportunity to express themselves. Because mm -hmm. so often they're not given that chance. And it's amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. what we kind of talked about today was when you pair them with somebody who's a creative, it just nurtures that. And then you've got that, you know, there's mm -hmm. no preconceived notions of, kid, the, of the creative community and what these kids can or can't do because sure. they're not special ed trained and they haven't, you know, so that yeah. beauty just sort of like, let's see what happens. And it's been amazing. Good. One father came today, a, a dad, he was interested in perhaps having his son come. And he said afterwards, he said, I think as much 
the, as much good will come of him partnering with a designer for five days as just being in an atmosphere where you could see that I could make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. Like people are being paid to do this here. And so I just think there's mm -hmm. huge. Tell, tell us how the workshops work and uh, what someone needs to know if they want to get involved in it. Sure, the, uh, it's a five day workshop. Mm -hmm. The classes are 75 minutes long. Uh, we limit the classes to eight students. We feel that's a good mm -hmm. uh, you know, ratio of students. Uh, over the course of the week, they will start uh, by kind of sketching out their ideas. They will then move into building the designs and the software. Uh, at the opening of the class, we have a sharing time. So there's, we call it embedded yeah, social embedded skills social so skills. that we're not teaching social skills, they're just part of the process. And then at the end of each class, they, we walk around and students are able to share what they've done each day. At the end of the five day session, we do, it's a big celebration day, so they'll, yeah. they'll present their finished project. We generally will get 40 people to come mm -hmm. because parents will invite grandparents and friends and things like that, and the kids will field questions about their sure. project. And this is something, um, I mean, there's a cost involved yep. in this. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Is it affordable for most families? It, the cost of the program is uh, 325 mm -hmm. for the five-week session. We do have um, some, we're looking at getting some sponsorships, mm -hmm. some scholarship uh, money. So we're, we want to make it accessible to every as many people as possible. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. a wonderful thing to walk away Folks, from. Folks, what, what hope can you give families of children with autism who may be watching this program right now and maybe just uh, newly diagnosed? Okay, I will say one thing. Our experience, we were left, Harry was diagnosed, our, our son Harry, at three, and we were not given hope. We were not given any kind of pathway. And that's one of the many things we want to be able to accomplish with this is there is hope and there is potential. And let's flip that lens from a disability to a capability. And because of that, whether it's something that can be done, you know, in just one class or it can be done as a career or it can be in a supported learning environment, these kids are capable of doing so much, and we have to flip that. We have to see the potential. Yeah. I would and say don't lower your expectations. Don't. Because we did not. Yeah. So right. all your life you knew he could do more, and you... We believe. There are days that are hard. Yeah. I'm sure. sure. You know, yeah. but you, you, yeah. you believe that, yeah. and you work towards it. Thank you very, very much Great. for being here tonight. Great. Appreciate Good you. Good luck Sorry. with Thank your you. project. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Mm -hmm. Thanks. The St. Louis River estuary is one of 43 areas of concern across the Great Lakes identified as having significant contamination. This week, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency released a video highlighting efforts to clean the river by 2025 and the need for additional funding. Here's an excerpt from that video. We're talking about Duluth today and we're talking about the St. Louis River estuary, that great resource that is upstream of the lift bridge and downstream of the bluffs. At the request of Governor Mark Dayton, sharing information about his proposed legislative initiative for a supplemental budget, a bonding request for $12.7 million to help with the remediation and cleanup of the St. Louis River, which is a federally designated area of concern on the Great Lakes. $12.7 million will leverage more than $25 million in federal funds because of the existence of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And so that brings the total up to $47 million that we could use to remedy the problems of the past, pollution that was caused by industrial activities dumping and, and contaminating the sediment of the, of the river and, and these wetland areas adjacent to the river. It's critical because of the governor's interest in clean water for all Minnesotans. 
We have more than 40 partners working with us in support of this project, and it's historic because of the agreement that these community uh, groups, the non-governmental organizations interested in fishing and in the environment, are all working together on a common plan. So specifically on this project, these bond funds would clean up 10 different unique sites along the St. Louis River. It is the legacy contaminants, the pollution that came from the early 1900s throughout the 20th century from industrial activities in the, in the harbor area, also in this, along the river. Things that include uh, in the contaminants are mercury, dioxin, PCBs, metals and other toxins. These toxins are dangerous to human health and they're also dangerous to the environment. Their existence without a remedy limits what people can do recreationally on the river. Our plan is to complete all the work needed to eliminate the pollution on this area of concern by the year 2020 and this is an important step in that direction. And so the Minnesota Senate Democrats bonding bill will be unveiled on Monday. No word if it will include the supplemental bonding money requested by the governor for St. Louis River remediation. All right, it's time now for the week's business headlines from Business North. The former pro-build property in Grand Rapids is being subdivided to accommodate three new companies. Two have been identified, Aldi Incorporated will build a grocery store, and Northland Restaurant Group will construct a Hardee's fast food store. Aldi, which opened a store last year in Superior, will invest $1.2 million in Grand Rapids. The Hardee's development is valued at $768,000. Both are expected to open later this year. Economics are improving for Iron Range Taconite companies, but still leave a lot to be desired. For the first quarter, Cliff's Natural Resources had lower revenues, but through cost-cutting, reported a profit of $117 million. The company also gained pellet supply agreements with two Canadian steelmakers. While losses declined for U.S. Steel, the company still ended the quarter $340 million in the red. The UMD Center for Economic Development honored a man last week who is considered the Northland's Dean of Advertising and Public Relations. Don Larson was given the Lifetime Achievement Award at the annual Joel Leibovitz Entrepreneurial Success Awards. Larson began his career 65 years ago and was a longtime owner of the Westmoreland Larson and Hill Ad Agency. Larson advised future entrepreneurs to keep their promises, build and maintain integrity, learn from their mistakes, work only for clients they like, and to hire great people. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. Good to see Don get that award, quite a guy. Now, if you have a comment on this week's show, give us a call, dial 218-788-2849 and leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org. You can also visit the WDSC website for updates on your favorite programs, to become a member of WDSC, and get the latest news about the station and upcoming events. And Pam, thanks again for filling in for Julie. Always great to work with you. And it is. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. The half hour goes quickly, doesn't it? It does. Right. It does. For Pam and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.